For 75 years, Argonne National Laboratory has accelerated the science and technology that drive U.S. security and prosperity. To celebrate, we're capturing the stories of the people who made it happen. This is Argonne Voices. Argonne's Advanced Photon Source, or the APS, is one of the leading light source facilities in the world. And after 25 years in operation, it's undergoing a massive upgrade that will make the ultra-bright X-ray light even brighter and will enable new scientific discoveries and innovations we can't yet imagine. But who were the masterminds who built the APS? And how did these engineers make it work? Here's a conversation between two of the brains behind the original APS, still in use today. Glenn Decker, the Associate Project Manager of the APS Upgrade, and John Goleida, who guided construction of the APS in the mid-90s. Fundamentally, the Advanced Photon Source is a synchrotron light source, and by saying light source, it's a little deceiving because it really just generates X-rays, and it's the X-rays which are the product produced by the Advanced Photon Source. And the way you make them is by sending electrons, which are charged particles, around in a big circle. And any time they get accelerated or basically wiggled by these undulator magnets, they emit hard X-rays. And if you adjust the wiggle just right, you can get just the right flavor of X-rays and the right color, if you will, since it's a light source. And then people build these many, many experiments around this big, large ring. And then uh, inside these experimental enclosures, sometimes they call them hutches, they do these fancy experiments where they do things like solve the structure of the ribosome and a number of other things. And there have been Nobel Prizes that have come out of the advanced photon source. That's something that I take a lot of pride in. But what do you think the advanced photon source is to the lay person? You described it quite accurately. It's an X-ray source that has features that you can't get from other X-ray sources. It's You can tune it to exactly the X-ray wavelength that you want. You can scan it with super high intensity. You can focus it onto the sample because it's such a compact beam and take data very quickly. You can use it to measure the distance between atoms in a molecule so as to solve the molecular structure. And uh, you can use it to measure changes in uh, properties of materials as a function of time as well, because it collects data so fast. It collects data so fast because the, the X-ray beam is so very intense and can be brought to bear on a, on a sample so that the data collection moves along very fast. In fact, it produces a deluge of data. The challenge then switches from getting enough X-rays to collecting the data that comes out, which comes out at such a high rate as to require you know, specialized computer systems. Beam's very intense. Uh, I remember it being described as uh, anything in the path of the beam is getting exposed to uh, heat of the sort that a meteor experiences coming in through the atmosphere. It's a jack of all trades. It can be used for uh, every kind of science, material science, chemistry, life sciences. And that's what attracted me to working on a light source. When I got out of school, it just seemed like maybe I wasn't gonna win a Nobel Prize, but I wanted to work on something that could produce a Nobel Prize for someone. That was very important to me, let's put it that way, that uh, you know, if I was gonna work on something, I wanted to work with people that I admire and uh, uh, work on something that's actually gonna produce information, results, discoveries that could affect people's lives in 10 or 20 years. I think APS has done that. It's going to continue doing it. Well, last week, I think, before I was going to leave and come to Argonne, I was still the X-ray ring manager at NSLS. And we were at our Friday user meeting, which is where the users would come in and write to the accelerator physicists about what was wrong with the accelerator and so forth. And I just remember in the middle of the meeting, the lights went out. We lost electricity to the whole site. And, you know, we worked late into the night. And then it wasn't until about 24 hours later that I found the very last thing that needed to be reset, some power supply on some beam line that wasn't working. He had to turn on a bias for an X-ray beam position monitor. But that was kind of my parting shot. The lights went out at NSLS for me. And then I came to start a new light over here at Argon. Argon was putting together a, a staff largely from scratch. And I, I got to say, they did a bang up job. And, uh, you know, the project was uh, run quite effectively. And, uh, 
my recollection was that the lab, you know, spared no effort to uh, make APS a really great organization. I, there were about 40 people there and the organization grew to hundreds, I don't know, 250 or 300 people. Yeah, those were the days. I was charged to head a group. I'd never done anything like that. I was four years out of grad school. The old days, I mean, I probably couldn't do this job if I hadn't gone through the first experience with you guys in the original APS. We uh, had thrills and chills trying to make the machine as stable as possible. I remember Glenn working on diagnostics and coming up with a very uh, high-tech beam position monitoring system in order to get the beam stability you need. That one time when one of the engineers reported that the girders were vibrating by one micron, which sounded pretty small to me, but then you you got pretty excited about it, as I recall. And uh, I learned an awful lot about vibrations after that, but I think we solved the problem. And to this day, I think the stability is really pretty fantastic in that machine, considering how old it is. That was a lesson that I learned. And for the new machine, I mean, we're putting the thing up on these big blocks of concrete, and that really makes things a lot more stable to start out with. And then you just bolt things to your block of concrete, and it doesn't vibrate very much. And the floor doesn't vibrate very much because we're lucky that we actually are relatively remote from big highways. As far as happiest memories, certainly the day we stored Beam for the first time in the storage ring was, uh, (laughs) yeah, I won't forget that. That was really nice. It's sort of like uh, a machine coming to life for the first time. And uh, you were there in the control room. I I didn't contribute very much because I was already in management. And, you know, it's too dangerous to let me touch the accelerator. I actually felt strongly about that. You know, if I was going to manage a project, I shouldn't try to twiddle the knobs too. But I remember uh, you would put together a script to figure out what the incoming electron beam energy was which was always the thing that bamboozled us getting stored beam. And your beam position monitors that could register the beam position on first turn gathered their data on a beam that went around once or, I don't know, twice and and then hit something. And the algorithm you put together figured out that the energy had to be dialed in a bit. And uh, when you made that signal, the the good energy signal, uh, the beam position monitors, you know, we would look at an oscilloscope and watch a little spike for every passage of the electron bunch. And the spikes just strung out to infinity when you got that right. That was quite a feeling, machine coming to life like that. To be able to have the opportunity to come here and build the biggest light source in the country and then get to do it again, but a hundred times better. It's just this amazing uh, light sources I can do. I still am kind of like I was in grad school. I just think this machine is so cool. I want to go turn knobs. And I don't know if I'll be able to keep myself out of control room. When we turn this thing on, I guess I'll let other people do it. But uh, particles going around in circles has always kind of been a kind of a passion of mine, I guess, if you will. I personally didn't think that light source performance would ever get to the point of the APSU over the years. You know, one of the reasons I got into this business was uh, because I thought the facility wouldn't go out of style so fast as a high energy physics machine. You know, when you build up enough data and you're looking for some statistics limited, tiny, tiny signal, a new particle, then the facility becomes less sexy. Its performance kind of goes like the square root of time. So, you know, it's initially it collects startling data. And as the years wear on, the data just adds to the last year's data, and it improves it a little bit less every year as you wear on. But that's just not the way light sources work. There's just a jillion experiments you can do with them. And they they don't really go out of style, except that the APS upgrade puts the APS out of style. Well, it's going to have to, because the the old APS is going to go away. I will cry a few tears on that. It's been a ride. And I, I mean, we'll see how this thing all comes together. You know, what you've done, the experience you've gathered over two light sources you know, I can't think of anybody better equipped to do what you're doing than you are. You're one of my heroes, Glenn. And I'm a lucky guy to have worked with you. Argon Voices is an oral history project, recording the stories behind decades of world-changing science at the laboratory. To learn more about Argon's 75th anniversary, visit anl.gov.